So one of the interesting differences between what I'm going to talk about and a lot of what you've heard is exciting results of work that's gone on at centers and by groups for a long time. I'm going to tell you about a project. Literally, the funding has been here for about six weeks, and it's a $60 million, 10-year project from the National Science Foundation to the university to do a, really a big experiment to see if we can make leaps forward in solving problems at the interface of people and the environment. We call it the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, short for SUSINC, or that's long for SUSINC. And the, uh, the mission is, I'll just focus on um, the functioning su sustainability and structure of socio-environmental systems. And I'll come back to that. First, I should probably explain what do I mean by a socio-environmental system. Well, basically, it's the recognition that scientists have done a lot of work, environmental scientists, and have uh, made major progress in understanding a lot of problems which have not, in fact, resulted quite often or most often in changes in behaviors or policies that will help to solve some of those problems. So what we're learning is that the relationship between what people do, the decisions they make, policies, whether or not their regulations, uh, their laws, or their markets, such as the massive emerging environmental markets, uh, structures institutionally, governance structures, or informal institutions, like how people interact. Those kinds of things are tightly coupled with the natural world in ways that influence human well-being. So, for example, if you just consider the coupled system as consisting of a social template and a biophysical template, ecosystem features, for example, the presence of a forest and ecological processes like the rate of carbon sequestration together influence things that people need like clean water, fuel, fiber that influence their quality of life. That quality of life in turn is going to influence behaviors, decisions, etc. And just to give you an example, let's uh, imagine a system, and actually this is going on right now, in which what we're seeing is major continuing changes in the movement patterns of people. We're starting to see mega cities develop. We're simultaneously starting to see shrinking cities like Detroit, where people are moving out of cities and leaving infrastructure behind. Well, let's talk about the case of increasing urbanization, some of which has been brought on directly by policies that have promoted infill, assuming that s environmental sprawl is a bad thing because you're disturbing little parts of the landscape um, all over. Well, one of the impacts this has had, there have been many, has been that the policies that have been set up to protect the environment allow you, for example, to damage or even destroy water resources such as streams, wetlands. The uh, person or the uh, group that destroys that, let's say a new Walmart is built, although I don't want to beat up on Walmart, it could be a new housing subdivision, uh, have to mitigate for those impacts. And so let's say they destroyed a number of wetlands in order to build more around the city center. To mitigate for that, they are now allowed to create wetlands, to replace those. Well, because of the market, land is cheaper in rural areas, so those created wetlands tend to be done in rural areas, not near the city center where they were previously. Well, a couple of results are coming out of that. One, what we're starting to see, of course, is major losses in all those aquatic resources in concentrated areas that already have problems with heat island effects due to all the asphalt, with uh, uh, NOx and SOx, various kinds of air pollutants, et cetera. Um, the processes that go on in those wetlands are influenced by two things, not just the presence of the wetland, and we now know created wetlands aren't functioning like natural ones, but secondly, how they're aggregated in space, if they are close together, if they are linked, versus if they are widely spread apart. So both the loss of those and then the redistribution and the changes in how they function do they actually remove the nitrogen? Do they sequester carbon even if they're moved out? 
have led to major problems that can influence, for example, if it's a coastal city, degraded fisheries, uh, increases in temperature, air pollution, which in turn can feed back to things like an increase in rates of asthma among small children in cities, decreases in recreational opportunities, et cetera. So you could, this is a good example of how tightly all this is linked. Well, so at places like most academic institutions and the National Science Foundations, we have all these stovepipes. We have the environmental scientists, not only that, we have the biologist in a separate division from the geochemist in a separate division from um, uh, another group that's important within the natural sciences, the computational people. What we proposed to, the, to NSF was to actually try to bridge all these disciplines that are necessary to address these kinds of problems. And we did propose this in a way that would involve doing synthesis research. So this is a socio-environmental synthesis center. That's a specific kind of research that doesn't involve new field experiments and going out with probes and me measuring gas emissions. It relies on the fact that there is a plethora of data around. It's all over the place. Some easy to access, some very difficult to access, and it's being vastly underused. So in fact, we would be spending in a way, wasting money to continue to produce a lot of data, at least in those areas where there is adequate data there. So synthesis research is research in which data, ideas, and theories are all brought together and they're integrated in ways that they haven't been previously. The idea is that this may create not only new disciplines, but help open up paths for solving problems in ways that have not been solved before. Now, so what is a synthesis center, which is what we have? Well, literally, we just, the university just finished renovating our space about a week ago. It's built in a way to deal with the experiment NSF wants us to undertake to see if we can facilitate all these disciplines coming together, working together effectively, and two, dealing with the information flow. So the way these synthesis centers work is they're not, the problems aren't going to be solved just by University of Maryland scholars. In fact, most of them won't be. We will, we will provide funds to bring scholars from any discipline anywhere in the world to the center to work in a think tank type setting with one another. They may be there for a week, once a week, every six months. They may be a visiting scholar that's in residence for a year. We'll have postdoctoral fellows. Highly diverse disciplines. So we're used to, you know, 10 years ago to me, a, a diverse, di a, a multidisciplinary group was me as a stream ecologist working with an ocean, or excuse me, a hydrologist and a geomorphologist. That's nothing like the kind of transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary work we're talking about now. We're talking about me working with a social psychologist, for example. The focus of this is what's called actionable, and that is we want to co-develop the critical questions that will be the focus of research and that we'll put out calls for proposals on with the policymakers or the, in, those that influence people. So it might be business leaders, it might be NGOs, influence people in ways that impact the behavior and in turn their quality of life. So what are some of the challenges we're facing? And one of the nice things about being able to speak today is I'm literally asking the broader community, not just today, to provide input about how some of these problems can be solved, but to consider coming to the center with ideas and testing those out. So some of the issues are not going to surprise you, highly distributed databases. We're dealing with uh, scientific subcultures where in the, among the ecological community, most of their databases are relatively small and they're in Excel spreadsheets or, or access. On the other hand, they need to couple that with real-time data coming from sensors in uh, aquatic systems, for example, and they need to be able to couple that with highly qualitative data that's come from surveys or ethnographic work. Very, very heterogeneous data that has to be put together. Um, we also have uh, issues that applying technologies that'll help us better understand problems. I would say probably 75% of what we do is going to be spatially explicit. That is, those data will exist at 
be uh, specific to certain places, and, and if you can think of a GIS type image, there will be rules that govern how things move between spaces, but they'll also be temporally dynamic. Can we use new visualization methods to do experiments on different policies that might influence that? So I want to, the, the questions that I would like to leave the group with um, are really related to these two issues, but I'm going to add the third that I just mentioned. One, questions related to how, how can we best deal with such highly heterogeneous data sets? And by that I mean, you know, totally different meta languages. Groups here creating ways to, to deal with their data that you know, maybe an EML type approach, an XML type approach, and those are much more compatible than other ways that data can be dealt with. But the second question I want to address to you is the incredible epistemological challenges we have. These groups of people are not, w are not used to working together, and it's very difficult. Just to give you an example, even among the leaders that put together this proposal, and it's several people from multiple universities, there's eight of us. We had major problems identifying the first theme we were going to invite the community, the international community, to apply to come to our center to work on over simple words. We were trying to describe how the movement of people influences environmental issues, and we had a very specific kind of thing in mind but the social scientists had problems with the term movement. The uh, ecologists had, had problems with the term migration. <laughs> the other groups suggested dispersal, which had very specific meanings to certain groups. Never mind the fact that our center is called uh, one that is focused on actionable science. The first talk we gave about this center in Germany a few weeks ago Two ecologists raised their hand and said, actionable means litigation. Are you going, is this center all about, you know, developing ideas to litigate? No, in the uh, sociological uh, scientific subculture, that actionable means influence, creating knowledge to influence some outcome. So ideas about that. And then secondly, we have huge problems. Really, I, instead of provenance, it's the idea of a proprietary. People don't want to let go of their data and make it freely available. And that's been a huge issue. It's a social issue, I realize, but it's something that we really need to address uh, if we want to move forward on this. Thank you. You just have to force them and put it into the grant that they have to make it available. So you think right. the stick is the, the Like the funding agencies need to actually make all this stuff available. I also applaud a lot of the universities that are trying to push that when papers are published that they're freely available to everyone. Like hiding behind even the ACN digital library just irritates the hell out of me, right? Yeah, I, I just published a paper in a journal, Shall Remain Unnamed, and they wanted $5,000 for open access version. Mm -hmm. It drove me insane because it's basically extortion. It's total extortion. You know what, like, it's other grants paying for all the research, other people with all right. their time and energy, like the editorial boards are free, like all those people are donating their time, and then some publisher wants to make money off of it. But, but I think your call for open data is really, really an important one, because I'll tell you a small story. Uh, we had a PhD candidate come by, he's just finished his, his thesis, he was giving his talk, and he, at the very beginning of his talk he says, oh, here's my website with all my data on it. I thought, yes. The guy next to me downloaded the data while the speaker was speaking. He gave the result, his, his design of his algorithm during the talk, and my buddy sitting next to me reproduced the entire thing in MATLAB. Reran the thesis on the data, got a different answer. Okay? Oh, no. No, no, no. No, this that's is, awesome. This is, this is totally, this this is totally is, great. This is what we should be doing. And, and what happened is that the first question he raised his hand and said, very, very kindly, you know, I have a different answer. What happened? Why, and they had a conversation which accelerated the scientific process significantly, right? That would have been impossible under the closed model. So it's I important. I agree. The right. issues that have to be approached, though, are first of all, uh, there's currently no system for acknowledging how difficult it is to produce a data set and make it widely available. So you don't get credit for it. Tenure is based on publications, on ownership, et cetera. So it's a well, social issue. You can get citations, right? So you publish a paper that explains the data set. 
There's tons of workshops for that, or even a technical report. And then at least you can get some citation and references of people using your data set. I would argue that the whole reward structure needs to change. Yep. I would agree with that. It'd be nice to know ways to accelerate that. Was this an NSF grant? Or? It was a, a, should be a microphone. Carol, you can it was NSF, share up yes. Behind you. I was just going to say because recently, because we just submitted a proposal, they now make you put a statement in there about data sharing and saying how you're going to share all the tools and the data that you collect, trying to get at this whole yeah. issue of yeah. people you know, collecting stuff but then not sharing it so that the whole community yeah. can benefit. So. Right. It, we'll see how well that goes. I'm really <laughs> familiar with that. <laughs> It'll I mean, take I don't ten know years what you or can more do to enforce yeah. it. Yeah. But well, just well, it's probably well, it's easy to enforce. Don't give them any more money. Yeah. That's well, right. Well, I mean, but NSF has to know that they're not doing it, and maybe I don't know if investigators are going to want to call up and tell NSF, "Look, they didn't do," you know, because email. Email. You didn't, you There's all show kinds proof. of public ways <laughs> to like, like share. <laughs> so, so at